Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm broadcasting to you live from my home studio in beautiful Philadelphia, and we are here with our final webinar in our 2020 series sponsored by Fish and Richardson on the opportunities and challenges for housing and homelessness for advocates after the 2020 elections. Uh, I'm Eric Tars. I'm the legal director at the National Homelessness Law Center, and I am thrilled to welcome today's panelists to talk about policy at the federal, state, and local levels. Uh, at the federal level, we have Jonathan Teklu, a legislative assistant for Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, advising her on economic policies from financial services to taxes and fiscal issues. Our state expert is Sarah Fox, the director of advocacy and community impact for the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. And for local perspective, we have Jane Wynn, the co-founder of K-Town for All and the 2020 UCLA activist in residence. Although participants can't speak during the webinar, you'll see on your sidebar a comment box in which you can type your uh, questions and which will be read at the end of the presentation. And we'll be ready, uh, we'll be able to respond at that point. Um, you can also see we have our uh, NLTHP homeless uh, Twitter handle here. Uh, feel free to tweet at us uh, and share the, the content from the webinar with the wider world. Um, so just to start us off, uh, let me tell you why I am hopeful that 2021 will be the year for the human right to housing. In 2020, despite it being hashtag 2020, uh, through our human rights advocacy, we were able to get Senator Warren directly calling housing a human right. And we also got Senator Booker and Senator Harris and Senator Sanders and Secretary Castro, all as presidential candidates uh, talking about housing as a human right. And now, uh, for the first time since FDR, we have a president-elect calling housing a human right. Um, and I was actually just uh, named a few days ago to a transition team stakeholder group, and they told us we don't even need to sell them on the idea of housing as a right, that they are operating with this as a baseline uh, principle. And so, you know, already we are way ahead <laughs> of where we were uh, just a, a few months ago. We also had Representative Omar and other members of the Progressive Caucus introduced the People's Housing Platform Bills, uh, actively identifying housing as a human right at the federal level. And is, uh, and we'll talk about more of that uh, later with Jonathan. And at the state level, we had a constitutional amendment introduced in California that would make housing an enforceable human right. And Sarah is going to talk a little bit about how that movement is uh, expanding in Connecticut. And at the local level, we had folks like the Moms for Housing and others taking over housing for people experiencing homelessness in direct actions to claim their right to housing. So I think there are a lot of reasons for hope. But at the same time, we know that millions of people are at risk of eviction and millions more are hurting. And this guy uh, refuses to negotiate an ample relief package. People are losing their homes already with lifelong impacts, and there's a very real chance that it will get much, much worse before it gets better. And we will see a dramatic growth in unsheltered homelessness. And we know that at the local level, when communities see more people on the streets, there's more of a push to get them out of public view through criminalization. And we know that all of this is having and will continue to have a disparate impact on communities of color. And as with all forms of institutional racism, all it takes to perpetuate the unequal status quo is for people to continue doing what they're doing today. So it's going to take active anti-racism to change that baseline. And we know that we are up against tremendous pro-racist forces who are pushing back. So there is no doubt that we have to be playing offense and defense at the same time. Uh, and we are already exhausted and traumatized from the past four years of active resistance. But to take us down to a deeper level on both of our hopes and fears, we've got Jonathan Teklu to help us. Jonathan is a legislative assistant for Congresswoman Ilhan Omar in Minnesota's 5th District, advising her on economic policies, 
born and raised in Baltimore. Jonathan started his professional career working in Maryland electoral politics. In 2018, he began consulting for progressive campaigns and in the campaign uh, finance and fundraising cap capacities, uh, made his transition to Capitol Hill after the 2018 midterms. Uh, in 2019, he started working with Congresswoman Omar as a legislative correspondent and quickly made his way up to a policy position covering her budget committee work. He's responsible for leading the rollout of her economic relief bills in response to COVID, which include the introduction of the Relief Act, one of the first and only emergency universal cash payment bills introduced before the CARES Act. Jonathan graduated from Georgetown University with a BA in government. And Jonathan, share some wisdom with us. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, at first, I just wanted to thank you and your team at the newly named National Homelessness Law Center for organizing this important event. Um, I'm honored to be here today on behalf of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and share some of our legislative priorities for the rest of this session and the upcoming Congress. Um, I truly believe, like you, Eric, 2021 will be the year that we can make uh, housing a human right in the people's house. We are going to have an all-star roster for progressive champions in the next Congress, and so I'm very excited to see the work of our newest uh, CPC members, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it will be to have a competent administration next year under President-elect Biden. All that being said, we will urgently need to make housing uh, right and not a commodity simply out of pure reason and necessity with the ongoing pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis has, has only exposed the vulnerabilities in our housing sector and worsened the deep systemic inequities in our economy as a whole. Tens of millions of Americans will be facing eviction once makeshift state eviction moratorium periods and the CDC eviction moratorium expire at the end of this year. With most of the physical aid having dried up from the CARES Act, Congress must act now to send direct financial assistance to American families. And that includes more relief checks, more enhanced unemployment insurance, and more rental and homeowner support, among many other measures. Of course, the HEROES Act set out to do just that, but the Senate and the White House have continued to block any substantial relief packages from the House, preventing vital aid from reaching our states and localities dealing with this raging pandemic firsthand. Heading into the new Congress, we need to be clear that housing priorities are non-negotiable. That is why I'm proud to announce that Congresswoman Omar will indeed plan to reintroduce her premier housing bill in the 117th Congress, the Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act, and the Homes for All Act. I'm sure most of you already know um, of the substance of these bills, so I'll just give a very very brief overview, um, but the Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act will suspend housing payments until 30 days after the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency declaration has ended. Um, the Housing and Urban Development Agency would be responsible for establishing funds to directly reimburse landlords and lenders for these suspended payments. The main reason and one of the major reasons that we decided to uh, roll out this bill during COVID is um, simply put, people will always end up um, falling through the, cra the cracks with temporary means-tested rental assistance and eviction moratoria. Um, it's just, uh, it's up to us to, to cancel housing debts during this um, unprecedented pandemic for our most vulnerable communities. And then um, for the, the Homes Guarantee work that we did um, with the Homes for All Act, that would authorize uh, $1 trillion over 10 years to build 12 million new public housing and private permanently affordable rental units. This bill establishes mandatory spending for capital and operating funds for public housing authorities to use for the construction of new public housing by repealing the Fair Cloth Amendment. Our public housing stock has been historically disinvested and neglected well before COVID-19 exacerbated our housing disparities. There's no better time than now to make bold and permanent investments to increase the supply of affordable housing in this country. Uh, and I did want to note some of the other uh, legislative priorities that our office is looking into in this, uh, in this space. Um, which includes uh, a bill, uh, an authorization bill 
for the Community Development Block Grant Program to fully fund the program, ensuring that flexible grants for, biz for business and economic development are centered on communities of color. Um, and those grants, like I'm sure all of you know already, those CDBG grants um, are typically used to um, restore uh, affordable housing and um, are focused on uh, developing economic opportunities for low income and moderate income households. Um, and the other bill that we're also looking at reintroducing, it was one of the first housing bills that Congresswoman Omar introduced in the 116th Congress, um, is a bill on manufactured housing, specifically a tax incentive um, for owners, uh, landowners, and mobile home parks to uh, transition that ownership to the actual tenants, the renters, and um, homeowners of mobile homes. Since there is uh, a very common regulatory issue in manufactured housing with the division of ownership in these mobile home in these mobile home parks that typically contribute um, or can contribute to rent hikes arbitrary evictions and other egregious abuses for already very vulnerable um, renters and, and homeowners. Um, and all of our um, housing work has been formed and organized by tenant advocacy groups, which is a, a thing that I think I'd, I'd like to probably say whenever, whenever I have these meetings. Um, and um, before I kind of go into to closing my little spiel, I did want to add um, sort of other economic priorities that we're looking at for the next Congress, especially since um, Congresswoman Omar already announced recently that we will be planning to introduce a universal basic income bill. Um, and you know, these type of direct financial um, aid bills are, are inextricably linked to the, the housing disparities that we see in this country. Um, so we will continue to, to work on um, economic policies that are prioritizing American families. Um, and like I said before, with, with the housing work um, being lifted up by, by many tenant advocacy groups, um, just that, that movement that we've been seeing in this Congress um, especially is what inspires me today and why I'm so optimistic by the great work that you are all doing on the ground. So whether it's grassroots uh, organizing, legislative advocacy, or legal outreach for individuals experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness, that work is invaluable and um, and that's the work that we we want to uplift um, and that that type of work has been going on for long before i i even entered this space and we would not be able to do it without your tireless activism and support so on behalf on behalf of congresswoman omar and the rest of our team i want to close by thanking each and every one of you for your dedication to one day guaranteeing housing as a human right in the united states I look forward to your questions and hear more from our esteemed panelists. Thank you, and I'll, I'll hand it back over to Eric. Thanks so much, Jonathan, uh, and uh, certainly uh, amazing to hear about the work. And uh, I, I think you're absolutely right that the um, you know universal basic income, whether you're addressing housing affordability on the rent side, on a, a sub direct subsidy side, or you know, on an income side, you know, it's all different means to the same end. So I definitely uh, appreciate uh, uh, that's that's all. It's all part of the picture. Um, I think it's definitely right to to bring it up here. Um, now moving on to the state level, uh, Sarah Fox is the director of advocacy and community impact for the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. She's dedicated over 11 years of her life advocating to advancing housing justice, advocating for critical housing resources, and creating the civic and political will to enact policies that will make life better for Connecticut's housing unstable residents. In her current role, Sarah is responsible for directing statewide advocacy initiatives and advancing capacity building initiatives to end homelessness. And Sarah herself was homeless while she was a child, and she uses that expertise and her training as a social worker to build strong relationships with stakeholders, reminding us of the stark reality of homelessness and emphasizing the importance of empowering those with lived experience in this work. Sarah was recently awarded the Reverend Richard Schuster Advocacy Award from the Reaching Home Campaign for her ongoing commitment to raising awareness about the needs of individuals 
youth and families experiencing homelessness or at risk of becoming so. She received her BS in communications with a concentration in program planning and development from Cornell and her MSW with a concentration in policy practice from Yukon School of Social Law, or of Social Work, sorry. Uh, Sarah, uh, let us know what is your view uh, on the opportunities and challenges at the state level. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, today, the new day in Connecticut, I think that, you know, over the past couple of weeks, we've started to breathe a little bit differently. Um, we had a, you know, we are a very blue state um, and, but with that still come some challenges, but I have to say, you know, I'm in conversations today that I never had before. Um, although Connecticut has made incredible strides in our work to end homelessness um, and to ensure that there's how that we have housing and available and housing subsidies for our most vulnerable residents, we have had a patchwork response to homelessness. And so often all of our advocacy efforts and our and our com conversations with communities have been very siloed. Um, today, we have a new approach, um, which gives me hope. And as someone who has experienced homelessness, I know that, um, and my mom also lives in permanent supportive housing and has been homeless. I know that oftentimes we just put people into buckets, buckets that are convenient for policymakers, um, where we're thinking about whether it's just, um, you know, um, whether it's TANF or whether it's um, Medicare or whether it's housing or um, the ability to access any medical services, those are all siloed and we don't look at the person as a whole. Um, and today in Connecticut and through our work to establish housing, the right to housing, um, we're really thinking about the person as a whole and all the supports that they need um, to ensure that they're able to be safe and stable in their housing. Um, and that's really exciting because it's a much broader view um, and it gives me hope for, for where we're gonna be in 10 years. Um, and so if you just wanna go forward, I can go through my presentation. There we go, well that's me. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this past year, um, we at CCEH, we are a statewide advocacy organization um, that has over 100 members who represent um, homeless service providers, municipal and state leaders, um, philanthropic giving, um, and many other homeless advocates. Um, we launched into this campaign um, for housing justice, um, focused on economic justice, criminal justice, and racial justice. Um, we're really, it's, it's dynamic and it's exciting and we have many, many new partnerships that are forming um, across the state that's really trying to get to one system to address the right to housing um, and looking at all of the ways that um, our broken public systems um, sort of lend to homelessness in our communities. Um, and for those of you who are not aware of the landscape of Connecticut, we have some of the greatest inequities between our um, between our municipalities and our suburbs. Um, we have a very high poverty rate in our cities. Um, and we have a huge issue with people returning home from incarceration who are um, discharged into homelessness. You know, it's not unlike many other um, cities and states across the country, um, but poverty is real in Connecticut and homelessness, although um, it's not as visible as it is in, in um, LA, it is um, something that, um, we have many families and individuals that are dealing with every day. And you can go to the next slide if you want. Um, we've made incredible strides over the last couple of years um, and been able to preserve a lot of investments um, in our work. We were one of the first states to um, functionally end veteran homelessness. And um, we have um, made great strides on our work to ensure housing for those that are most vulnerable, um, the chronic homeless. Um, and but today, but through that, we still have this huge gap. And what we say around, we have um, a coordinated system of care in Connecticut for people experiencing homelessness. Um, so it's one statewide system with seven coordinated access networks. Um, 
but when we think about our system and we think about our response, we say it's a leaky system because it's sort of like put together with bubble, bubble gum and scotch tape. We never have enough resources and we have a scarcity mindset. So I've, you know, I've been doing advocacy for 10 years, um, but in through those 10 years, I've asked for meager investments. I've, you know, I've talked to legislators and said, well, we're ending chronic homelessness, but will you just preserve, 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 never invest. Um, and then came Senator Anwar. So um, he uh, is an incredible leader at the state level. Um, and we've been working with him. He's the chair of our housing committee. Um, and he had a conversation with us about setting a goal that by 2030, we would actually be able to ensure that all residents in Connecticut are able to have access to safe, affordable, adequate housing. Um, and so last year we began our work to establish the right to housing in our state. And we started with this dialogue and we started to get legislators not only interested, but engaged in the conversation in a way that went far beyond just saying, well, you know, this is how many units of housing we need to preserve. These are the dollars that we need for supportive services. We were finally able to say, you know, we need adequate housing. We need to ensure that our families have access to housing and that it is needs to be established as a right. Um, and that we have to look much more closely at what it means to end homelessness. And ending homelessness is not something you do with just a meager amount of dollars. We can't just be the end result. It has to be something that we're continuously investing in and housing has to be at the forefront of everything we do. So this is a quote um, from the Hartford Current, which is a very popular paper here. Um, and there's a ton of news articles that came out um, in a flurry around um, this last session. And this session, we are reintroducing the bill, um, but this time we're doing it um, much more focused on the United Nations um, work um, on establishing a right to housing. And we're working closely with Leilani Fahar from Make the Shift and Eric um, Tars from the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and students from Yale University and UConn, um, the University of Connecticut to sort of make traction and build this statewide movement um, that hopefully um, that is rep that replicates what's happened in LA and some of the work there and in California um, and the work taking place across, you know, well, globally, um, you can go forward. So Senate Bill 105 is the bill that we worked on last year and um, we're making a lot of traction this year. So these are just some of the key components that we're narrowing in on. Um, and I'll just move quickly because I know I'm closing towards the end of my seven minutes. Um, but we want to ensure um, through our work that we're recognizing the right to adequate housing um, and that we have a statewide definition of what adequate housing means. Um, we also recognize that in our state, and I'm not sure actually what this looks like in other states, Eric, so maybe you can fill us in later, but having someone who is a citizen's advocate who can actually advocate on behalf of people who are facing discrimination, um, who are unable to access housing, who have any sort of violations that occur in the right to them, for them to access housing. You know, I'm thinking about conversations we're having right now around, um, you know, ensuring a statewide response for equal access. Um, and that when um, transgender and non-binary people um, are turned away for shelter, we actually don't have someone to address or provide any form of legal recourse in our state. And so, um, this person would actually be able to serve that function. Um, we've made tons of traction, as I said before, in, in developing a coordinated statewide homelessness response system, but it doesn't come with sort of the, you know, but, but it's a patchwork of, um, it's a patchwork of um, organizations and we don't have sort of the formal um, levels of recourse that are necessary. Um, and so we're hoping to establish that. We also, um, we have been working on engaging many more people with lived experience in our work um, who have experienced homelessness and we want to sort of codify into our law a formal advisory board so that our work is just continuously um, based upon what is working, what's not working, and we're able to um, have a very um, live and true understanding of the impact of our homelessness response system and of our housing and um, 
of our lack of housing and the impact that that has in our communities. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of our work is centered on, you know, our to, on eliminating homelessness and decriminalizing homelessness. Um, so we are setting a statewide goal and time frame to end homelessness. A lot of our work has gone through. Um, we all we have we've set many many goals, um, but sort of resetting a statewide goal and time frame. Um, and I believe, you know, and we've talked about having that coincide with our governor's um, when his um, time in office will lapse. And but we're we're still we're working with our communities to figure that out. Um, we also are doing a ton of work on reentry reform. Um, and having conversations with every municipality and town across our state about, you know, what it means to have pan handling, what what your response is, what mobile crisis looks like, and um, with a lot of the police accountability reform that's happening right now, um, it's just the time is right for this conversation and talking about, you know, what it means to have people re-entering into our communities. Um, homeless um, and how we can ensure that there's just this reinvestment um, and and have that all sort of in this package as well so that um, so that we have the the adequate resources we need to ensure that that people returning home from from incarceration have housing um, we are looking much more deeply into evictions and sort of and working to develop a response with our judicial branch um, you can just go forward because i'm taking a lot of time um, but i'm much i'm very happy to share this work with anyone if you want to reach out through eric um, and um, we're happy also to have people sort of you know provide their expertise if you've worked on this before um, we're looking we're having a lot of conversations about making homelessness a protected class we're talking to um, CHRO in Connecticut and figuring out, um, and we are also doing work to um, ensure that landlords cannot blanketly discriminate against people who have criminal records, um, similar to ban the box, but um, ensuring a statewide process for both federal and state housing. Um, and so that's written into this as well. Um, we're looking into landlord accountability and then establishing a legal right to counsel. So this is a, it's a lot of work and it's new work. Um, but I mean, it's new, I mean, it's, it's recent work because we've been working on it for just a couple of years, but it has allowed us to expand our partnerships in ways that we never have before today. Um, you know, we're in conversations with ACLU, um, SEIU 1199 and labor unions. Um, we're going beyond just sort of homeless service providers. And for those of you in the field, you know that oftentimes, you know, we are very siloed and we, and we, we while we've made great um, strides with our, um, with working with hospitals, with emergency response, um, sort of having one unified response and bringing new advocates and um, interest groups into the conversation, I think is, is going to be um, the wave of the future because homelessness and housing insecurity affects everyone. And so how do we do this together? Um, so that it's not just the people who are, you know, really focused on homelessness or having these conversations so that it's raised up in a way where it, this is just the fabric of who we are um, in Connecticut. We don't, we will not have homelessness. It is very wrong, you know, well, in my view, and as someone who's experienced homelessness, um, you know, I just think about what, what it meant to, you know, not have, well, to see my mom not have the money that she needed to, to sort of keep our family whole. And when I go to emergency shelters, you know, it's the same thing. When I look at when I look at the when I when I speak to the moms, when I when I when I talk to the children, and I think about the impact that this is having. And no child should have to experience homelessness. We have a lot of work that we can do. And this right to housing, I think, is just it's the right time. It's it's the right way of thinking, and our nation is ready for it. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that's right on. And I love ending on the note of um, building bridges uh, with other communities. I think, um, you know, what we see with when we frame housing as a human right is that, um, you know, you can make the, the parallels to other human rights and it emphasizes the inner uh, interdependence of the rights. Um, you know, you can't have a right to uh, adequate education if you don't have a home to to study in you, you you're you know 
well, you can't have the right enjoy the right to health care if you don't have a, a home in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and you know, the right to a living wage and, and decent wage is intimately tied to what is the the cost of housing in your area. So I think it's definitely um, you know we're going to win in this work by emphasizing exactly what you said that we are all in this together and that um, when we address housing it helps it helps across all of those causes. Um, so now to uh, bring us home is uh, Jane Wynn um, and Jane uh, oops, uh, uh, unfortunately I neglected to copy Jane's <laughs> bio over into this uh, in this panel so I will let Jane introduce herself um, if she wants to any further than I did at the beginning other than saying she's the co-founder of uh, K-Town for All and um, the 2020 uh, UCLA um, uh, activist in residence. So uh, Jane, uh, take it away and let us know what you're seeing at the local level uh, in terms of uh, both the opportunities and challenges you'll be facing uh, after the elections here. Hi, uh, I'm Jane. I'm the co-founder of K-Town for All. Um, good morning from the West Coast. It's still uh, 11.30 in the morning here, so it's quite early. Um, so uh, K-Town is located in Los Angeles, so I'm gonna get to a very hyper-local level. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, K-Town for All is a very uh, neighborhood-based organization consisting entirely of unpaid organizers and volunteers, including myself. So I don't have quite an impressive resume as everyone else um, on this panel. I am uh, a I live in K-Town and uh, we started doing outreach to our unhoused neighbors, uh, learning about what the needs are in our community. Um, so that's that's what we do. Um, we are not uh, professionals, uh, but we are trying our best. And so you will hear from um, a very blunt um, perspective um, and a candid perspective of what, from, from an activist who is, uh, often yelling at politicians. Um, so um, I'll go over what homelessness currently looks like um, in Los Angeles, the solutions that are being proposed, um, the current legislative climate at City Hall, and what our hopes for uh, post-election. So in Los Angeles, uh, homelessness went up by 16%. Um, and this is according to the uh, last count, which is before COVID-19. So um, in LA County, there are 66,000 unhoused people. So um, once again, this was before COVID-19 um, with the economic hardship, with a uh, surge in evictions, it's definitely higher now. Uh, 66,000 was already an undercount. So that's the entire county. In the city of LA, um, it's 36,000 people um, and 27,000 people who are unsheltered. So um, Throughout the entire county, there are only 15,000 shelter beds. Um, if so, if you do the math, uh, there are there's nowhere for people to go, um, and so it's a very it's very visible in Los Angeles and um, even in my neighborhood of Koreatown, uh, which is only uh, one and a half square miles uh, approximately. There's um, there are hundreds of um, unsheltered people and their encampments. Um, in, in many blocks. And so when we do outreach, uh, we provide hygiene supplies um, and referrals, uh, try to connect people with services. We do that every week. And we um, we reach out to about over 200, 200 to 300 people every single week, um, just in the neighborhood of um, Koreatown. And um, it's, uh, it's devastating because um, there is nowhere for people to go. Um, as I mentioned, there are only 15,000 shelter beds in the entire county. Um, Los Angeles passed um, a bond measure in 2016 to build 10,000 permanent supportive housing units. So they have uh, scaled back that estimate significantly. So now it's only about 7,000 of these permit supportive housing units that will be built um, in the next few years. Um, 
there's only been one um, development that has come online uh, since that time. And that, that project only has 15 units. So uh, looking at the scale of the problem with 36,000 people who are homeless in the city of LA, um, and only one project has has come online with 50 units. Um, the the current handling of this um, humanitarian crisis uh, is is an indictment of what the city of LA has been doing for the, la the last few decades, which is prioritizing criminalization, um, depending on public and private partnerships, um, rather than pursuing uh, things like social housing. Um, and this has led to um, immense suffering and deaths. So in this year alone, over 1,100 people have died um, in Los Angeles County. So approximately uh, four people die every single day in LA. Um, and, and we see this um, on our streets. So there was one particular weekend where there was um, a brutal heat wave. It was temperatures were over 100 degrees. And myself and, our, and volunteers were trying our best to provide um, cold water to people because that's all we can do because the city has neglected to provide to open up cooling centers. Um, people didn't have anywhere to go. And we, um, and, and some of my um, uh, members of Cape Town for All had to assist people, call the ambulance to people who are, who are having heat strokes. And that weekend, um, 19 people died. Um, so this is uh, an unacceptable um, crisis. Um, this is how the city of LA is responding to this crisis. So they are now um, hoping to pass an ordinance that would make it illegal to sit, sleep, or lie down on the sidewalk. So um, right before the election, they tried to uh, sneak past um, an amendment to the existing ordinance that we have, which uh, which bans sitting, sleeping, and lying down everywhere in LA. And so that is unenforceable. So they were hoping to amend it to make it illegal to uh, sit, sleep, and lie down anywhere in LA as long as a vague offer of shelter is offered. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, we don't have enough shelter, but as, as soon as uh, someone offers uh, shelter, you can then, you know, make it illegal to sit, sleep, or lie down. And I want to um, uplift Eric Tarr's work on Martin versus Boise. Um, it's what city council is trying to do right now flies in the face of that ruling. Um, but uh, they are scaling it back a bit, and they are hoping to pass it next week. Um, so they would make it illegal to uh, lie down in store property um, underneath freeway underpasses. Um, and this is especially cruel because uh, winter is coming um, and it gets rainy and people need shelter. They seek refuge under freeway overpasses because it shelters them from the rain. Um, but um, city council, um, well, at least I, I wouldn't say all of city council, but there's, there is a significant reactionary faction within um, city hall that is very much intent on passing criminalization ordinances rather than providing um, solutions to housing, and we know that, uh, sorry, solutions to homelessness, and we know that the solution to homelessness is housing. Um, there are some uh, progressive members. Well, we have one, uh, Mike Bonin, who represents Venice, um, the west side of LA, and he has proposed um, uh, an al alternative motion to uh, the criminalization. Uh, which is, uh, he's he's a proponent of the Homes Guarantee, and so um, he has put forth um, a social housing um, proposal and to commandeer hotels. So that is, that's one thing that we could do right now, uh, commandeer hotels to um, house everyone immediately. And with the tourism industry um, devastated by COVID, we have uh, 100,000 hotel units in LA, and uh, a UCLA study um, estimated that 70,000 of those units are going to be vacant for the next five years. Meanwhile, we have 66,000 people who are unhoused. Um, so if we really wanted to, Mayor Garcetti could commandeer hotels, put everyone in hotels where they can safely quarantine 
uh, right now, but we don't have the political will and we have politicians who are bought by um, corporate hotel developers. Um, and so they are, and also um, another issue here is uh, the city budget. Um, so uh, we work with uh, the People's Budget LA that's led by Black Lives Matter. Um, so I'm gonna go a bit into what the post-election landscape looks like with um, some of the progressive wins that we've had recently um, and the strides that we've made in defunding the police because that is, um, it, it's uh, absolutely essential part of um, housing and homelessness advocacy is we need to shift funds from the police to invest in the community and to invest in housing and homelessness. So um, LA has been, has seen um, really a historic election in which progressives turned out to, to elect change. Um, Nithya Raman is a Homes Guarantee candidate who uh, won overwhelmingly. She beat an incumbent. Um, and Nithya Raman um, is uh, one of the co-founders of SELA, another um, grassroots um, organization that had to step up because the city of LA didn't provide services and didn't do their jobs. Um, and then we also, um, we voted out Jackie Lacey, uh, who is a, uh, a, the, a district attorney that's um, very uh, pro-criminalization. Uh, so she's out. And then we also voted to defund the police through Measure J. Um, and so that would invest about $1 billion away from incarceration and policing to community investments. Uh, so that gives me um, a lot of hope. So despite all of the things that we have to constantly fight um, against with the brutal criminalization uh, measures going through City Hall and sweeps, um, just the, the constant um, drumming up of, of anti-homeless rhetoric um, from, from our elected officials and from the community um, as well. There, there's a lot of hope here because um, it's clear that LA is much more progressive than our electorate um, and far more progressive than uh, Mayor Garcetti. Um, and I should um, also mention that uh, our mayor is in the running to be appointed to the Biden administration. So if you wanna see um, the failures of housing policy enacted at the national level, uh, Garcetti is uh, is the person for that job. Um, and hopefully Biden will, you know, seriously think about what housing is a human right means um, beyond just rhetoric. Um, so if he really believes that housing is a human right, he will reject uh, Mayor Garcetti's failed policies um, and, and really listen to um, tenant rights advocates and um, the grassroots organizers who are on the ground trying to um, trying to solve this issue. So that's all I have from LA. Um, I, I could go into so much more, but um, I also wanna hear some more uh, questions and go into a deeper discussion on other things. Uh, great, thank you so much, uh, Jane. And um... Yeah, we uh, do have a lot of questions and um, a good amount of time to get them answered. So uh, we'll start um, going around here. Uh, I think one of the first questions is, um, we'll go back, uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Jonathan, but um, others can chime in as well. Um, which is uh, talking about restoration of public housing uh, and you know, protections in public housing, but just being able to um, actually start building adequate numbers of units again. Um, uh, we had a question about um, you know how how that'll be done through uh, some of the legislation that uh, Representative Omar is is proposing and, and other uh, bills at the federal level. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about that, and then Sarah and Jane, if you want to talk any 
more about uh, you know public housing issues at the local level uh, or the state level. Definitely interested to have you chime in as well. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think for for us for the um, just working with the Homes Guarantee Coalition with that bill um, last year, uh, our Homes for All Act. Um, I think there's a lot of potential, um, or at least having a progressive marker out there um, to make sure that these investments are permanent. I think it's it's not helpful for anyone to have, um, you know, kind of willy-nilly appropriations with um, with housing, but especially with historic um, under or or historic disinvestment in the public housing stock. I think it's 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 probably the ideal time now to make um, more mandatory budgetary um, mechanisms available for, for this kind of funding. Um, and I think that's probably the strongest piece in, in our own Homes for All Act is making that spending mandatory um, instead of having, you know, sort of the, the debates, some of the, like, like Sarah mentioned, some of the um, scarcity, anti-austerity debates or, or austerity debates that we're having um, in the House and, and Congress in general. Um, I think it's, it's time to move beyond that, right? It's like the federal government, not a household. <laughs> we do not have to worry about, um, you know, living within our means as the federal government. Um, and especially during a pandemic where millions are struggling to put food on the table and, and are living paycheck to paycheck or um, unemployed. Um, I think the best, I think the best, way forward is to make sure that this funding is um, is made to be automatic. Um, and in terms of sort of like other proposals out there or just movement in general in this space, I think there's um, definitely a lot of support for uh, rental assistance, even if it is temporary, but, but just extending um, and investing in rental assistance for this year and, and next year. Um, and also for, um, you know, extending mortgage forbearance and and um, extending the the, fo the foreclosure relief um, that I believe is all ending at the end of this year alongside with the eviction moratorium uh, the national eviction moratorium under the C or after the CDC um, so <clears throat> I think there's a lot of movement um, in our caucus to, to keep pushing for those priorities um, but you know we're, we're not the only member of Congress and the homes Guarantee. There's also um, a, a great number of members, whether it's um, you know our our CPC chairwoman, um, Congresswoman Jayapal with her housing is a human right bill. Chairwoman Waters also um, has a pretty great bill, uh, the ending homelessness bill, um, kind of boosting some of these um, investments um, in uh, some of the, the HUD programs addressing homelessness and housing insecurity. Um, so whether it's uh, ESGs or CDBG investment, I think there's still a lot of potential, hopefully with this uh, new administration, to have a budget that you know, truly reflects our values. And I think this will be the best time for us to focus on, um, on housing reform and housing um, investment. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree, uh, you know, linking your, what you were saying to what Sarah was saying earlier about having this scarcity mentality, I think for for far too long at the federal level, you know, we in 1980, we saw the, the federal housing budget, affordable housing budget cut in half, and it has never come back. And every year, um, you know, we've seen advocates who are happy uh, when we are able to simply maintain <laughs> what we have, which is half as much as is needed, and it has been half as much for 40 years now, and um, and so things just keep getting worse. And so I think one of the most encouraging things I'm seeing is that there are actually you know, serious, well-thought-out proposals um, to not just maintain the status quo, but to really uh, make the kind of revolutionary changes to just bring us back to, to you know those pre-1980 levels um it, it, but we also have to make up for, for the past 40 years as well and so like to to go um go much bigger 
than simply maintaining what's there. And I think the more that, um, you know, obviously we're not going to get everything all at once, but um, uh, but setting out that expectation that this is uh, this is where we have to be heading, I think, is really important. Um, Sarah, did you want to say anything more to that point? You're on mute. Um, so at the state level, um, you know, for the first time, really, we're also pressing for a progressive taxes. Um, we haven't asked for a, pr any real tax increases. We have a governor who is definitely, you know, lending to, you know, Governor Lamont is an incredible governor, um, but raising taxes is not something, you know, we have in Connecticut, we live uh, under the fear that everyone will flee the state um, if taxes are imposed. But in our inner cities and in our communities, um, we don't have the resources to have adequate education, adequate housing, um, adequate access to medical care. Um, and so that's a new conversation that we're having. Um, and it just, you know, it really, I feel guilty as someone who's been an advocate to have to have had such a mind, you know, and who has experienced homelessness to uh, just thinking about the impact of my conversations every day with legislators over the over the last few years and what it has meant for me to say, you know, preserve, preserve, protect and defend these resources, not thinking about the long term impact. You know, those are things that I think we need to start questioning and that our policymakers really need to think about, you know, when Jane, when you're speaking about, you know, these really arcane um, policies that they're thinking about enacting in in LA, you know, those are things that happen in our communities every day that people don't question or even know how to question. And so it's it's involving, you know, people of color, it's involving um, people who the grassroots movements that you're speaking to um, in this sort of movement to fight for for a better country for us all. And so um, so I don't know if that exactly answered your question, Eric, but I'm really, you know, I'm really pleased to be part of a conversation where we're thinking about what it means to have this right. Jane, did you have anything you want to, to add to that question or? <laughs> um, I forgot the original question, I'm sorry. Just talking about um, uh, the role of public housing and being able to shift back to a, a place where we can actually uh, you know, build new units and, and make more public housing as opposed to watching it crumble away. Yeah, um, I mean, in LA, we are seeing uh, affordable housing um, covenants expire. And uh, so what we need is permanently affordable uh, public housing. Um, but there, like I said, uh, the political will is a uh, is not quite there on the city council level yet. And even though there's a, a council member that's introducing um, social housing um, in my backyard bill, so we, we're calling it Shimby now, uh, social housing instead of um, public housing, um, that uh, that needs to happen in the new um, the uh, new city hall um, as 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 soon as uh, we get Nithya Raman in there, and as soon as we are able to. Uh, flip some of our more moderates into um, taking on progressive stances. Um, it's um, it's a fight that we're ready to have um, in the upcoming year. Is uh, we need to fight for um, social housing um, in LA. Um, just another good question for everybody. Um, how can we explain quickly why housing should be paid for by taxpayers when speaking to those who say? Why should I pay for someone else's housing? Anybody have any good responses to that question? It's really expensive not to have access to housing. Um, it costs far more to have people um, in our emergency shelters, um, providing services through emergency response, um, incarcerated. Um, it is for a relatively light investment, we can have people that, you know be safe and stable and at home and not using all these really costly interventions that for so long they, you know, the cost when we talk about incarceration um, and the move to, you know, really 
move people out of incarceration and into our communities, um, the savings for taxpayers is huge, as is the um, benefit to our communities. Um, and and that's the conversation that we're having in Connecticut um, today. Um, how do we actually, you know, reinvest in our communities? Um, we're actually moving towards prison closures in Connecticut and talking about moving those funds back into the community, ensuring that people are able to access um, housing and the community supports and medical supports they need um, in our communities as they return. So I think it's just, it's vital that we think about the benefit of housing um, instead of the cost uh, on taxpayers. Any other thoughts, Jonathan or Jane? Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, we spend so much more um, on homelessness through criminalization and the carceral system that if we were to provide homes, um, it's it's better for everyone. It's If you want to think of it as like a cost-benefit analysis, a purely transactional one, uh, it's uh, much more beneficial to everyone. Uh, that people have homes to go to, but it's also um, beyond that cost benefit analysis. It's also the right thing to do. Um, everyone should have a home and we are a country that's wealthy enough to make that possible. Yeah, I, I think that both said it perfectly, so I won't add much. I'm just trying to remember the, the idiom, though, of rising tide in a small boat or something like that. But um, even though I'm sure it definitely feels like it with, with social media and, and um, you know, these COVID times, you know, we, um, our communities, like, we don't live in very siloed um, places. Like, we're, we're very much like an interconnected economy as a, as a whole with our, with our local economies as well. And um, also with our with the greater society so you know if we can secure housing for um for people that for people that need it um like that, that, that has been like a proven method time and time again as, as building wealth uh, not only for that person um, but also for the community as a whole um so like like sarah and, and jane mentioned perfectly already like the the least that we can do with the um amount to, with the amount of fiscal space that we have as you know, one of the richest countries in the world, um, but also with the, the federal, you know, monetary sovereignty as well. Um, you know, the United, the United States can can afford to, to house, um, you know, to house the rest of the country. I mean, it just takes the political will to do so. And I think, you know, if we're willing to spend trillions on, you know, tax cuts for the wealthy few, I think we can afford to, to house the the majority of Americans. Yeah, uh, I think that's all right. I think, uh, you know, coming back to the scarcity point, if the COVID crisis has done anything, it's shown us the, you know, the falseness. Like when we wanted to find the money, we found several trillion dollars that people said didn't exist and we were able to get, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of people into hotel rooms, um, at which they said, you know, couldn't be done, that everybody just, you know, shelter, inadequate shelter uh, was the best that could be done. But, you know, uh, I'm hoping that one of the opportunities of the, the crisis that we're in is that it has broken down those, uh, you know, false assumptions um, and that it's opened up room for more, uh, you know, uh, more of these in the reforms that have long needed to happen, um, but everybody just said it, it, it can't be done. Um, and especially, you know, now that uh, we have the CARES Act dollars, not just going to rent hotel rooms, um, but to actually purchase hotels and convert them into permanent housing opportunities for, for people experiencing homelessness, um, you know, there's just so much potential for for using this as a transformative moment. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, there's there's lots of uh, hope in that, but also uh, I'm really scared of the 
the scarcity uh, that's going to be in, you know, going to be imposed through fiscal austerity measures because of the, the lack of incoming tax dollars, particularly at the state and local level. But I suspect that um, uh, with Trump out of office, the Republicans uh, in the Senate will will refine their um, desire to be fiscally stringent um, and and try to limit this uh, this work that you know it's as Sarah said it's it's not about the cost it's about the benefits and if we look at it that way it's it's an investment um, in in all of us rather than just uh, than a cost that you have to bear. Um, we got a couple of questions about um, uh, issues of race and the intersections with um, criminal justice uh, and, and homelessness and COVID and all of that. Um, uh, I'm, and, you know, obviously we, we've got uh, increased conversations people are having that uh, we weren't having um, before in you know, kind of the the, um, the marches uh, and, and protests of this this summer. Um, how do you see that you know that momentum um, or you know the pushback to that uh, playing into to conversations um, you know at the at all of your your respective levels. Um, Jane, uh, I'll put you on the spot. Um, uh, do, do you feel like uh, uh, these these kinds of conversations are are helping, hurting, um, or you know, creating opportunities, creating challenges? Uh, however, you want to think about it. Yeah. So, um, race and uh, housing and homelessness are intersected issues. Um, uh, in LA, there um, the unhoused um, population. Forty percent of the unhoused population um, is black, even though black people consist of nine percent of the overall um, population of LA. So it clearly is a race issue. And if you respond to um, if you respond to homelessness with punitive measures uh, like criminalizing the existence of homelessness, it is disproportionately affecting. Um, Black people. So we're seeing our city leaders respond to um, the Black Lives Matter movement protests with um, rhetoric like reimagining public safety. Um, and they're holding all these town halls to gather input on alternatives to um, policing. Um, but at the same time, they are promoting um, their measures to criminalize homelessness. So um, it's incredibly hypocritical. Um, and we're lucky that we get to work with um, Black Lives Matter LA um, in uh, trying to uh, put forth a budget that reflects the priorities and needs of um, Angelinos. And so the People's Budget LA had um, a survey uh, and I think, I don't remember exactly how many people, but it was, um, for the first time we had um, a participatory budgeting process and we surveyed um, hundreds and thousands of Angelinos and overwhelmingly people wanted to defund the police, reinvest in actual solutions to public safety. Um, so uh, we're gonna be continuing to hold city council accountable um, to what people really need. Um, but, um, but they are, um, they're determined to uh, continue, maintain the status quo. So um, after the protests of this summer, uh, city council um, agreed to defund the police budget by $150 million. Um, and that is a drop in the bucket because the city of LA's police budget is over $3 billion. Um, it, was a, it was an appeasement tactic. Uh, we were not happy with $150 million. Uh, we need so much more money um, uh, diverted to housing and homelessness. So if you look at the, 
the budget of LAPD, it's over $3 billion. Um, the budget, the homelessness budget is $400 million. Um, so for every $4 that the city spends on homelessness, they spend $30 on policing. Um, so that, uh, you know, systemic racism is uh, manifested in the city's budget. It's uh, manifested in how the city is responding to homelessness. Um, and so that's why we're so committed to uh, working with Black Lives Matter LA in uh, pushing forth um, a true reimagining of public safety. Sorry, Jonathan, um, anything you wanna add about uh, the intersections of, of you know, racial justice and, and housing justice and, uh, and the opportunities uh, or challenges it, it might create? Yeah, yeah, I'll speak to you on the on the federal level. Um, so obviously for, for our office after the police killing of, of George Floyd, um, there was um, definitely a lot of conversations of how our policy responses could um, best be tailored, you know, not only to um, address these systemic racial inequity issues in our district, but also many other districts um, facing um, Kind of you know historic vicious cycles of, of poverty and and police violence um so the congresswoman uh, introduced a, a slate of bills of criminal justice bills uh, reform bills um, including um, bills on on uh, on police protester violence um, amending the insurrection act for example and and also establishing a national uh, police um, misabuse of, of force um, commission um, and or board. And, you know, on top of that, I think the most in, important thing that um, we saw after seeing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act being passed on the, on the House level was that there is still um, a need to address the economic issues um, that are tied to racial inequity. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next Congress, um, there'll be more conversations and, and more bills, just frankly, more bills out there um, addressing the economic injustice um, alongside racial injustices. Um, because, you know, in the, in the, in the, the House package, for, for example, um, you know, there, there wasn't any sort of economic relief or, or economic um, reform there. Um, and we're, we were hoping on on our end with um, CDBG community development block grant program reform. If there's a way in which we could take an existing HUD program or um, an HHS program and start to target it on historically disinvested communities of color um, that tend to be the the victims of um, or share share victims of police violence, I think that's the best way in which we could start. To address some of the um, some of the housing and and um, economic inequality there, um, and you know, with with our bill in particular, with the CDBG reform bill, um, we do think that there should be you know direct carve outs on the federal level that will only be for um, you know minority minority owned businesses and and um, Minority-owned entities, so including you know nonprofits, CDFIs, um, that solely focus on work for for under um, uh, for underserved populations, um, and I think that's that's the best way in which we could start to tie some more of our policy making and in, in addressing um, both the, the racial and, and economic um, injustices in the in, in the housing sector. Anything you want to say, Sarah? Um, I mean, in Connecticut, similarly uh, to the national and local level, that you know, we are we're really digging into what um, criminal justice reform looks like and what it means. And I think you know, and I I realize that I often sound like I'm really optimistic, um, but and I and I am definitely optimistic for our future and. Um, but we're having different conversations than we've ever had before. 
and even internally at my organization the connecticut coalition to end homelessness we're really looking at what our you know race what race equity means to us and then we're having those conversations across the state um, and thinking about you know and similar to what jane said you know we know that that um we know that many individuals who are returning to communities um, or who are incarcerated are disproportionately people of color um, and we are looking at the 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 impact that that's had for so many years um, and what the disinvestment has meant when people have returned home from incarceration and have been unable to access public housing to access um, state-funded housing um, and asking the tough questions about why those policies exist and then working with landlords and working with um, realtors and working in collaboration to you know really do the reform necessary at the state level to change some of those arcane policies um, and it you know it starts with the grassroots movement but then it also is about having the tough conversations with policymakers about why these really um, you know, why these policies exist that have such a harmful impact on our communities and how we can actually reform them together. Um, and then we're working in collaboration with our um, police chiefs and with our communities to sort of build a, out a um, police response. And we also have a police accountability task force that um, came to be recently at the state level. Um, and there they're having town halls and, and having conversations. Um, we need real reform in Connecticut. Um, and we really need to talk about, you know, what it means to be um, a person of color and to have, you know, in our cities, as I said before, you know, it's such a just, you know, 10 minute, a 10 minute drive can really, um, um, the difference between our suburbs and our cities is so great. Um, it's astonishing and how we can sort of make it so that everyone has access to the same resources um, is a conversation that we need to have. Um, uh, a number of people have asked about model policies um, and uh, Jane, I'm wondering if you can say another word about um, mm -hmm. Measure J. Uh, I was on a panel yesterday uh, where somebody was mentioning uh, talking about it, um, and you know, as I understand it, it, you know, it's basically requiring the county to set aside a certain percentage of its budget uh, to investing in traditionally marginalized communities of color through things like housing and healthcare and, and other things, um, and none of that funding can go to law enforcement, and uh, so it's a it's kind of operationalizing the defunding the police and you know but not just taking the funding away from the policing but actually investing it in the things that are going to make our communities actually safer um, and somebody said that uh, they were talking with um, Patrice Kalours one of the co-founders of uh, Black Lives Matters and she was like you know this is reparations this is um, like you know this is this is how we actually do this um, so I'm wondering if you can, if, if I'm getting it right, and if uh, if uh, you can talk about it potentially, because I do think it could be, uh, you know, a model for how other communities um, divest from a law enforcement approach and invest in in housing and other solutions. Yeah. Um... I think we uh, sometimes forget to take a second to celebrate momentous victories and Measure J passing is definitely one of them. Like it's a uh, Measure J is a uh, diverts 10% of the LA County budget um, to uh, solutions, investments um, in the community away from incarceration. Um, it's not enough. Um, it's about $1 billion. Uh, we need so much more because um, local governments have um, steadily, gradually throughout the decades, just diverted more and more of community funds um, to policing. Um, and so that's reclaiming, um, the community reclaiming money that's um, theirs. And it's only, it's, uh, it's a historic measure, but it's uh, far from enough. Um, and then uh, at the the city level that we need to see something 
of that sort um, at the city of LA level as well. So the LA County budget, I believe is, um, I just looked it up. I think it's 37 billion, close to $40 billion, um, 30, sorry, $35 billion. Um, the city of LA budget is uh, $10 billion. Um, and $3 billion of that goes to um, the police. So uh, there are these um, these uh, housing measures such as uh, Proposition HHH that um, city leaders like to point to and, and say that, look, we're really investing in housing. But um, if you look at Prop HHH funds, it's $1 billion over 10 years. So over 10 years, we're investing in, um, in housing uh, with $1 billion. That's only a fraction of um, the LAPD budget in one year. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when Black Lives Matter LA convened um, the People's Budget LA, it was, um, we didn't know what to expect. It was one week before the murder of George Floyd. And we, we were trying to stop uh, Mayor Garcetti's disastrous budget from passing. Um, and we thought there's there's no chance that they're even going to consider this because the LAPD budget has been seen as untouchable for so long. Um, city Council rubber stamps it. They don't ever question it. Um, and then when the um, George Floyd protests started happening, um, Melina Dua, uh, she likes to use this phrase, the whole world cracked wide open. And we need to seize this opportunity. We need to continue building uh, momentum. Um, to to truly uh, reimagine public safety and to deliver on um, what the community community really wants and needs. That's great. Thanks for for sharing that. Um, yeah, uh, there are other questions about uh, international models as well, um, as as well as municipal and, and state and federal level model legislation. And uh, you know, I, I want to draw people's attention back to the approach that Sarah and the Connecticut uh, coalition is taking, which is actually using the international framework, the, the UN guidelines on implementation of the right to adequate housing, and going guideline by guideline through it. Um, and looking, you know, how does our state currently meet this guideline? Um, because there are a lot of things that, you know, states are already doing. Um, but where are the gaps? You know, I, what's underfunded? What, you know, laws need to be filled in? Uh, can we create a right to counsel so that people who have, you know, renters' rights can actually enforce them? You know, what, where are those gaps? Um, and at the end of the you know the day we will have a comprehensive bill to implement the right to adequate housing across you know, across the board uh, in the state of Connecticut, and it may not all get passed at once. It may go into separate bills for you know different uh, you know based on different considerations, um, but we'll have the the framework there. And so I think uh, you know there are definitely plenty of excellent pieces of legislation out there that can be replicated. Um, but I think this approach of taking uh, taking the international framework and applying it to your state, to your city, uh, to the federal government could, could all really um, be a transformative way of just a, of approaching the idea of what's, you know, what is uh, model legislation. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you want to say anything more about about that process and how how it's working uh, for you. Well, I mean, we'll have to see what this legislative session holds. Um, I mean, our whole entire legislate our session here in Connecticut is going to be completely different this year. Um, COVID has definitely, um, you know, changed the way that we actually do. Um, our legislative process will all be Zoom calling, um, and that's where all of our testimony will take place. Um, but we are excited to have um, Senator Anwar, who's actually a medical doctor, who's leading the work here in Connecticut with 
the right to housing um, and the thought that housing is medicine. Um, and, you know, and working just, it is guideline by guideline um, and changing the dialogue. Um, last year, when we introduced the bill for the first time, we set an audacious goal, but even the housing advocates were pinned against each other on whether we were going to just address um, the elimination of homelessness and just people who are homeless today, or whether we were looking at those who, um, you know, are, are in unstable housing or perhaps couch surfing um, and those um, who, you know, it was even before the conversation about the eviction, the eviction moratorium and, and the impact that COVID would have. I mean, it was pre-COVID. Um, today, the conversation is much more about establishing the right and it's looking at the whole continuum of housing instability. Um, and I think that it's a much more richer, full conversation than we've had in the past. So um, there's a lot of work being done to lay the groundwork with um, legal experts from across the state. And then um, of course, um, those who are experts in human rights law. Um, and so, you know, more to come. Um, it's gonna be an interesting process to see, you know, how this, how even having these conversations at the state level you know, what the impact is and what it means for just our communities to have this conversation instead of just tolerating homelessness and housing instability. Great. Um, we are coming up towards time. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to start thinking about any final uh, comments you want to make. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go quickly to a poll and uh, just do a, one quick question. Uh, is, uh, will you use what you've learned today in your advocacy on behalf of people experiencing homelessness during COVID-19 and beyond? Um, hope that this uh, session has been useful for everyone. Uh, and, um, you know, we, as I said earlier, we have been doing these webinars on homelessness uh, during the COVID crisis all year long. This will be our last one for the year, um, but we will definitely be coming back for, for more conversations uh, in the new year. Um, so I'm going to close this out and... Uh, Share our results, which is everybody learned something, which is fantastic. Um, so that's a great uh, credit to all of our panelists. Um, uh, I'm gonna quickly just note that uh, you know this the COVID crisis is forcing us all to see um, and truly understand that we are interconnected, and that without housing and sanitation or services. Our neighbors on the front lines of the deadly pandemic um, are going to continue to be there unless we find the solutions um, that uh, that are going to be lasting. And the crisis has shown us that there are effective and inexpensive ways that we can provide housing as a human right. And we have to go back and ensure that we don't go back to the status quo, um, but that we can do better uh, for communities moving forward. And I hope that. Some of you will consider supporting the Law Center's work towards uh, both those immediate as well as the longer lasting solutions. Um, and on that note, again, special thanks to Fish and Richardson for sponsoring the webinar series. Um, and uh, I will uh, now just let our uh, panelists, if they have you know, one minute of any closing thoughts they want to share on, uh, you know, on this or you know what they they see for the year ahead anything that they they haven't said yet um so we'll go around uh Jonathan, you want to you want to go first yep yep i i can start um well first of all can you can you guys hear me i feel like my headphones might be dying but okay great um well thank you again for for the opportunity um to speak on this great panel it's been informative for me and um, especially just working on the on the federal level to hear um, the state and local perspective is um, is very important to just inform the work that we do. Um, 
And I think the, the final thought that I, I guess I have for the policies that we want to push for in the new Congress, I think, you know, there's a lot of optimism and a lot of hope out there, at least, at least for me, that um, in this new Congress with the progressive members that we're getting and, and also um, the movement on the, the grassroots level for more progressive housing policies um, that are directly centered and um, uh, directly centered on tenants and and are um, propped up with their perspective. I am very hopeful that these um, these priorities um, can keep being um, you know at the at the top of our mind, especially with this ongoing pandemic. Um, and I think the most important thing for us to know as um, as lawmakers or just working in the the federal government is even with. Um, a friendlier administration. Um, I think we need to be cognizant that there will still be uh, accountability for, you know, the new, the next HUD. And um, if there is, you know, on the part of Congress, if there is more um, financial assistance and, and funds in the housing sector going to states and localities, that there's also sufficient oversight and accountability because, you know, like our speakers mentioned, um, we need to make sure that homelessness is not criminalized. Um, that poverty in the housing sector is not criminalized. Um, and, you know, as the federal government, we can't just kind of um, assume that these policies will be implemented in, in good faith. Um, so that's kind of the, the last thought that I have is, you know, even though we have our Homes for All proposal and our rent and mortgage cancellation proposal, um, you know, we'll, be, we'll keep pushing for, um, you know, better, uh, better implementation to make sure that, uh, renters and 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 homeowners and also those individuals experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness during this crisis are are taken care of. Um, so thank you again for for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Sarah, any final thoughts? Um, I just really appreciate the chance to be on this panel and just to think more deeply. Just listening to you, Jane. Um, you know, just brought the reality of what people are experiencing in communities across even my state, um, but across the country um, to the forefront. And so I really appreciated that um, today. Um, and as a person, you know, I, um, as a person with lived experience um, of homelessness, I can just say that this conversation is heartening um, and we need to be yeah. out there yeah, engaging yeah. more people who have lived experience and more people who are falling through the cracks in our system every day and all the work that we're doing um, and having them participate in our conversations in a really truly meaningful way um, and that just that will that will also help to change the way that we view housing instability and homelessness um, and move towards having it actually a right and have the investments that we need because um, without their voices, we're never going to be able to end homelessness. There too. Uh, Jane, anything you want to close out with? Yeah, uh, well, thank you again for having me. It's always an honor to be included um, in national conversations and to share our perspective from the extreme local level. Um, and I, I do also want to end this on a genuinely hopeful note because um, we are seeing a level of engagement and activism from the community um, like never before. Um, and our numbers are growing. We are having so many more community members who um, are reaching out to their unhoused neighbors, building relationships. And so LA is seeing a progressive wave. Um, our elected leaders right now don't reflect um, the compassion uh, and and kindness um, of our community, um, but we are going to keep um, holding them accountable, um, especially Mayor Eric Garcetti, um, who has failed the city. Um, and yeah, that's um, that's what I want to end on is that uh, you can count on um, community members um, getting engaged and uh, trying to solve this issue. So um, look to your local grassroots organization. And uh, I'll just uh, close out. I saw somebody uh, in the Q&A uh, reminded me that uh, today is actually a national call-in day. Um, 
with the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, so uh, check them out, NLIHC, NLIHC.org um, for details on that. Uh, call your congressional representatives and centers and tell them that we need rent relief now and that they need to pass a comprehensive uh, uh, um, bill uh, addressing the economic impacts of, of the COVID crisis. Um, so yeah, let's get out there. Let's make uh, housing or human rights together. Thank you so much, everyone.